be very soon. We're all very excited to get that and we're all working diligently on making sure it's ready. Um, and then on top of that, the other project that I've been working on uh, with Rohan and Elena is actually uh, research into supporting multi-asset on-chain, um, like custom assets. Um, this can be used for you know any number of things. We're, we're still kind of in the research phase, but we're making good progress and we should be able to begin writing code here pretty soon. So it's, I mean, it's going to be such an exciting project. But yeah, beyond that, I will hand it over to Derek, who's going to talk about some of the stuff he's been working on. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Derek. Um, as Daniel mentioned a bit, uh, I've been working on block gossip uh, for a while. I got some messages in place and it got some handlers for those taken care of. And then um, I switched over to helping work with Daniel to get the transaction gossip work out. Uh, and shortly after this, he's going to come over with me and we're going to help finish up and get the block gossip work out. Um, the block gossip work I've discussed a little bit in the past, but I'll kind of cover it again. Um, the main improvement I think we're going to see here is that you won't have to download the transactions off of a block if you already have them in your mempool. You'll be able to just insert the transactions in the block straight from the mempool. Since the transactions are a majority of the size of the block, probably at least 90% of the block size, um, this has the potential to make downloading a new block be almost free if you've already been receiving the transactions. Um, so yeah, pretty excited about that. Uh, we've been happy with the transaction rollout, so the block, uh, the transaction propagation rollout, so hopefully the block should come shortly. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been working on the past couple of days has been um, reducing the size of the mempool by filtering out uh, transactions that have spends that are already in the chain. Now, these transactions wouldn't ever actually end up on blocks, but we didn't have any code in place to filter them out from showing up in your pool of transactions in your node itself. Um, so that was resulting in uh, keeping around a bunch of transactions that wouldn't ever end up being useful. Eventually, they would expire and get kicked out. Um, but when we filter them out as they come in, um, it, for one, prevents resending out those transactions to other people. So it's, it's going to save a bunch of bandwidth in the network. Um, and two, it also helps us give a more accurate view of how many transactions are actually waiting to go onto a block. So with these changes, we see um, like the actual number of transactions waiting to go onto a block. And then as soon as a new block comes in, we'll see all the transactions drop to near zero, which indicates that like most of them got picked up and put on a block. Um, and so that should be really nice. Um, we're really excited for that to go out in the next release, and it'll probably reduce the number of transactions pinging around the network by quite a lot. We're seeing the mempool come down by like to about a 10% of the size that it currently is, at least. So um, that's going to be really cool. Um, one more thing I want to add, too, is that we've got a bit behind on uh, reviewing community PRs. So I'm going to try to catch up on those. I don't really like to let them sit around for a while. I know we've mentioned trying to have a better response time for those, and we put some effort into making it easier for people to communicate or contribute um, and pick up some of these issues hanging out. So I want to make sure that like, if people do put in the effort to uh, fix bugs, are responsive and getting them in there. Um, yeah, so that's for me. I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence to talk a bit about some of the issues that we've been seeing recently and what our plans are for dealing with them. Yeah, hey, everyone. Um, so I'm uh, here to talk a little bit about uh, some of the great feedback we've seen from the testers, uh, Ironfish community, um, people using nodes and running uh, Ironfish, the Ironfish client. Um, we've seen a whole bunch of issues that have come up. Uh, one thing you may have seen if you filed any of these issues is I've gone through and uh, personally verified, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute, but verified or closed you know, a number of issues that have been hanging out. Um, our goal here is to organize everything, performance and general usability issues that people have seen with Ironfish as, it, as, as uh, you've been testing the client. So I'm going to quickly go over some of the things we've seen. There's there's a whole, there's a number more. If you want, if you're curious, you can look at our, our GitHub issues list, which is now current. 
uh, but I will, I will go over some of the bigger ones that I know are affecting the community. We've actually had a few fix through some of the changes that we just discussed with the team. Uh, we've seen, especially with the transaction gossip uh, update from a few days ago, if you aren't on it, definitely uh, you should see some, some uh, performance update, uh, performance upgrade by, by uh, moving on to the newest, newest version. So that's really, really exciting. And we look to have a number of releases on that same vein where we really focus on performance updates with the release. Um, the things that we've seen are, and the first one's actually interesting because it's sort of a dual user experience. Sometimes some people have had issues with deposits not seeming like they're being processed. And part of that is performance-based and that sometimes just the deposit command is slow or unresponsive and that, that should be fixed mostly by the work that uh, Matt just talked about with Wallet 2.0. Uh, the other side of that is a little more subtle, which is we have noticed that the fees that you have to, you know, when you do a deposit, does a, a default fee of one or, and we've noticed that as we've gotten more transactions, which is great, uh, some of our miners that actually process the transactions end up processing transactions with greater fees than just one or. So what happens is the transaction goes through, everything seems fine, and doesn't get picked up and put on the blockchain by a miner. So uh, that's something we're addressing in a different way, which is going to be uh, having the deposit command be a little more dynamic in terms of fees. Um, the other one that's big is out of memory issues. We've seen sort of unresponsive nodes, people talking about, uh, you know, I left this on overnight and they came back and it wasn't respond, responding and uh, that's obviously a problem. It's probably due to some sort of memory leak. We are investigating thoroughly on where that could be. Uh, it's something uh, I want to make sure that everybody's aware we're looking at actively. Um, and then other ones are um, node to nullifier. That's, that pops up from time to time. We see those, uh, you know, in a lot of reports. Usually it's a symptom of something uh, and, it, and it leaves sort of data in a state where it causes that error. And um, also we have, you know, just a general Jason who is on vacation this week, otherwise would probably speak about this much more passionately than myself, but uh, you know, we, we are always looking at the UX of Ironfish. We are very proud of the fact that it's relatively easy to spin up and run Ironfish node versus some of some other crypto projects out there. And we're always reviewing that process to ensure that we keep it that way as we build new features. Like one of the things that happens, good intentions and you just start slapping features on there and all of a sudden it becomes a little harder to use. So um, keeping an eye on that. Um, as always, if you have issues, you can submit them through GitHub. Uh, we, have, we are now actively uh, triaging those issues and working through PRs as, as uh, Derek mentioned and Adi's gonna talk about that now. Um, we, we've just revamped the whole process. Hi, thanks, Lawrence. Okay. Hi, everyone. I speak to you all every day, I guess. So, uh, as Lawrence and Matt mentioned, that we uh, have now taken it upon to respond back to your bug submissions and pull requests much more quickly. So, we have a one week response time at the most for pull requests and a three day response time for any bugs that have been submitted. So, one thing I want to mention here is uh, earlier there might not be been a more clear vision on how you should do this, but now we have announced and I have just shared a link on where you could get started. So if you're a programmer looking to get started, if you like finding out bugs or if you found bugs while using the network, then I suggest that you submit them through GitHub so that if at all it is something that, that we've not come across before and it helps us make the network more efficient, you you earn 100 testnet points. So this is a good way to earn points uh, as a bug reporter. Second is pull request. So you earn well, you know points, one point for a transaction, but if you submit a pull request, the range for rewards for pull requests range from 250 to 1000 testnet points. Uh, scale of the pull request, right? So if you are skilled in these, or if you're looking to get into this arena, just look at the announcement that we've made recently and uh, read out the guide that has been set up. One more thing I want to add is we have created a discussions forum. Um, the link for that also is in the announcement. 
And the third thing is that also has a list of uh, a board where we have listed good first issues. So if you are overwhelmed by the scale of the network and you understand programming, but you're not sure where you can get started. So there are these issues that we marked as good first issue, which would be good blocks to get started with. And as you grow, you know, you can uh, explore further and make better or more contributions. So here I'd like to give a shout out to WD021, uh, Scatrook. There's also another community member who built something. One second. Contributors. So I think what is his name? Mr. McTavish or something. Yeah. So a bunch of people have been contributing and uh, we really value your contribution. Uh, one thing I want to add here is if you are creating a PR, just ensure that first you are doing that to resolve an issue, right? There was a a discussion recently uh, on the contributors forum about this. So yeah, just that kindly read the guidelines ones so that you are better equipped at submitting uh, pull requests or bugs that help you on testing points. Um, also another thing about uh, ambassador program. Right now, as we do, we shall definitely inform through announcements or through the ambassadors channel. So yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you everyone for um, all the updates. Uh, I think we're kind of ready to, to close this out. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, please ask them in the monthly Pulse channel. Um, if we see the questions come in after we close this out, we'll still try and answer them. So, uh, you know, don't be too concerned that we won't get to you. Um, so in terms of uh, some last closing thoughts, um, we are aggressively hiring, um, kind of what Aditya said, uh, you know, if you are the type of person who loves to write code for decentralized distributed, uh, systems, um, that are privacy preserving, if you are curious about zero knowledge proofs, if you're curious about scaling, um, you know, a web three product, um, or again, a decentralized system, we would love to speak to you. So we are currently really aggressively hiring for uh, back-end or protocol engineers, um, as well as front-end engineers, um, and pretty much anybody, anyone in between. If this is something that you want to work on, you know, please let us know. We're also hiring for some non-engineering uh, roles as well. Uh, we're actively uh, looking for a marketing person. Um, we're, uh, you know, if you are the, the type of person that loves to uh, produce content for how to make um, Web3 products, uh, more understandable, or if you are the type of person that um, wants to figure out how to scale marketing for uh, for a Web3 product that is pre-made at launch, um, if that is exciting to you, please, please apply. We're definitely looking for people like you. That I think we're kind of ready to close this off. Um, again, I cannot stress how thankful we are for such a great community. Um, so many people have jumped into our Discord channel and uh, you know, have told us that um, our community is one of the healthiest that they've seen. <laughs> that people have, um, you know, been mostly focusing on asking uh, really healthy questions about how Ironfish works, about the tech, about how we make it better. Um, and so again, I am just so thankful for the community that we have built. Um, so one of the questions that, uh, that, I, that I'm just seeing is, could the team share any details of how they plan to bridge the privacy layer with other cryptos? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so um, Matt has kind of shared a little bit of one of the features that we're currently working on, which is multi-asset support. So right now we have uh, a really great privacy foundation where every single transaction is fully private using zero knowledge proofs. Um, what Matt and um, Rohan uh, is working on is how do we expand this protocol to support multiple assets? Um, and so that's actually the, the precursor to this question of, well, how do we support bridges? Um, so once we are able to um, support multi-assets, we can then think about how do we support bridges? Um, and that will allow a user to transfer an asset from one chain to Ironfish. So you can imagine something like a wrapped DAI or another wrapped Ethereum asset on Ironfish, where um, you know that asset would get the benefit of you know the strongest best uh, best privacy that our industry has to offer. Um, I'm yeah. So someone also asked, uh, what are the timeline for mainnet? Um, again, I think the best resource there is the roadmap. Um, 
you know, it's really hard to predict because we're we're working really hard, um, but we also want to make sure that we ship something good. So um, we are actively making sure that uh, performance of Iron Fish is good. Um, we're focusing on optimizations and so on. Um, so if you are curious about how much we're progressing, I would definitely check out the roadmap. It is being updated quite fr uh, frequently by Lawrence, who's our engineering manager. Um, and if you think you have the skills to help us uh, progress on this roadmap faster, if you're a developer, uh, please, please apply. We're, we're hiring, um, you know, we're mostly hiring Canada and the United States, but we are looking into other countries, um, especially if people are willing to work uh, you know, time zones that are <laughs> somewhat com somewhat compatible with you know with the United States uh, time zones. Uh, so yes, please pl uh, please apply. Okay, um, I think that's it in terms of questions. Um, Adi, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, a quick shout out to the folks who've been creating design and uh, posting articles on Medium and making quizzes and stuff. So thanks a lot for uh, doing that, engaging with others and doing some sort of creative puzzles and everything. So that's really cool. Uh, and I would love to, we would be really appreciative. And I, everyone does, I guess, in the community. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. Awesome. And I think with that, we can close it off. Um, happy Friday, everyone. Um, again, thank you so much. Please continue giving us feedback. We're continuously making Ironfish better. Um, cool. And I think uh, I'll close out with that. Uh, until next time. Bye. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thanks, everyone.